is clearly in the Word of God, and it is abundantly clear in Ephesians. So the doctrine is there, but it's our mere attempt to try and capsulize that doctrine and to put it to word and to express the truths that are there. And so union is just a mere attempt at doing this. But the, the thought that we're going to continue to run across in Ephesians is in Christ. Two words, prepositional phrase, locative of sphere. So I'm going to talk about the being in the sphere of Christ quite often. But it is a profound phrase, two words that we can sum up all of our relationship to Christ and to God in this one statement, in Christ. I mean, if you look at the statements that are made here in verse 4, just as you were chosen, notice, in Him before the foundation of the world. As Paul looks sweepingly to the eternity future and the consummation of all things, verse 10, he says, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things, notice, in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth, in Him we have obtained an inheritance. So as Paul runs through this over and over, in Him, in Him, in Christ, in Christ, we will see again and again. All the blessings that we have from God the Father is in Him. So I want to walk through verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1, and we are going to look at these blessings that God has given us, and they should lead us to glorify the Father for these spiritual blessings that we have in the Son. And it is interesting that when you look at Paul's letters, and this is valid to do when you're interpreting Scripture, is that to look at the, if there is an author of several works within Scripture, we can look at their works to get a sense of how they write. And it's good to do this. So when I was preaching through the Gospel of John, I was also teaching through 1 John on Wednesday night in Bible study. So a brother was reading through both those books, and he says, I'm noticing there's, there's a similarity in all these phrases and words that are used. And I said, that's good, because it's the same author. So it helps us to understand the phrasing and the, and the terms that are used and what they mean by them. It's interesting that if you compare Paul's letters, there are two letters that he has where he begins like this with a passion and intense outburst. The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, and here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And both of them state this exactly so. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a statement that is unusual for Paul. In the sense that normally in his letters he will begin with a thanksgiving and then prayer. And we will find that in verses 15 and following. But first he begins with this doxology, this, this eulogia, if you will, or this eulogetos as he is focusing on the things that God has done and uttering the blessings of God and that he should receive him. And so he is going to turn to his thanksgiving, his typical thanksgiving and prayer, later in the letter. But first he must run the full course of this eulogetos. Or in Hebrew, the Barakah. He is blessing God. He is glorifying God. He is giving Him praise for the things that we have received in Christ. And I have to say this about this particular passage because many have looked to try and find this nice outline for this section. It's really tough to do. You'll notice that in most of your translations, there are periods in these verses from 3 through 14. There are no periods in the Greek. In other words, this is one spontaneous outburst by Paul in regards to God. And when we find such things, we understand there's going to be long, complicated sentences. And so he likes these run-on sentences. And this is one sentence in Greek, 202 words. He just piles one phrase upon another. In other words, he is so overwhelmed by the truths that he is reflecting on here that he cannot control himself and he moves from one thought to the next and there is no break for him. Now I'll just tell you in the Greek, in the original, in the original writings back then, they didn't even have spacing between the words. So he just piled up thought upon thought upon thought upon thought. So it brings us some interesting conundrums if we look at verses 4 and 5 because we have the reference to in love. And some translations put it at the end of verse 4. Some put it at the beginning of verse 5. It can go either way, and we're going to talk about this in this passage. He moves right from one thought to the next thought, and he has all of these phrases that he piles up on one another. But here's what's amazing about this letter. There are eight sentences that he has like this in this letter where he cannot control himself, and he just utters and utters and utters the truth. Eight of them. It's 
is my kind of writer. I could never figure out punctuation. Never knew when to stop. And you know this, if you've ever been excited about anything, right? It's like you just can't stop talking about it. And you just want to go on and on and on. And you just look for the next set of ears that's willing to sit and listen to you for another hour after you've already talked to an hour with somebody else. But you want to keep telling people how amazing this truth is. And this is the Apostle Paul. He is so enraptured. His heart is so inflamed by the truths that are here. He cannot stop himself. And he is overwhelmed by the reality of what God is doing. Keep in mind, he is sitting in prison in Rome as he writes this. And I want to say to you, as you read through this letter, look at the various sections where we find these run-on sentences. You will find there in sections that deal with praise and prayer. And we'll look at the structure of all of this as we move along through this. But he begins with this declaration of glorification to the Father, and it is uniquely given to God. The wording that he chooses is very precise. It is very unique. It is not used of anybody else. There is a play on words here, and fortunately for our English translations, it's brought out, but they all share the same stem, eulage, and we find this in our English translations. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in every spiritual blessing. So he piles up these words, but it's all built off the same stem. But this particular term, it's, it's from Hebrew. It's related to the word baruch. So in the Psalms, we have Barakah. We have these statements of blessedness in regards to God. And usually with these statements of blessedness in the Psalms, it's immediately followed by the character and nature of God, which tells us something about who we are as creatures of God. One of the fundamental elements of our nature is that we are to display the nature of God. We are created in His image, are we not? So if you want to know why are you here, (laughs) this is part of the reason why we're here. Why are we so unique as creatures that we are hybrids, that we are both physical and spiritual, that we have part visible and invisible dimensions to our being? Why are we designed like this? Because we are to display the very nature of God. Thus, we are image bearers of God. So this is what Paul does with this. As he responds to the blessing, the eulagesos, he is going to respond with eulagetas. So he does this when he talks about the grace of God in 1 Corinthians and so on. He talks about how we we experience the charis of God and then he expresses the eucharisto, the graciousness towards God for the gift of grace. In other words, he's just reflecting back upon God that which he has received. But this particular word in this form in the New Testament is only used of God alone. The same thing can be in Hebrew. So if you look at Psalm 1, we have blessed is the man who. Now it's interesting because there in Hebrew the word is asherah. So that word is used in reference to man, that he is blessed. But when we talk about God in the Psalms, bedekah. So Paul is using a term that is explicitly only used of God in reference to the fact that he is the one who is uniquely to be glorified. It is uniquely due to God. Why? Because this is the nature of who he is. In other words, it reflects his intrinsic character. God is worthy of our homage and our praise. George Herbert knew this. He knew that our God was worthy of praise and glory. He just knew that whatever he did, even the best of what he did, would always fall short. It's always a reminder to me, no matter what I do for God, I'm just a dust-begotten man trying to communicate a God who is eternal and unfathomable And I'm a fallible, finite being. I'm always going to fall short. I'm never going to measure up. I'm never going to say all the things that are worthy of our God. But Paul is going to try. God is worthy of our blessing, not merely because of his perpetual, unchanging blessedness, but because of his perpetual, unchanging claim on homage from all of his creatures. He is due our worship. Thus he begins this way. In other words, we can't talk about our salvation without glorifying God, but sometimes this is what happens. It's interesting to me, it's astounding to me, that we label it theology, which means the word or discourse about God, right? So everything we label is theology. and Whatever doctrine we look at, it's quote-unquote theology. But here's what I find intriguing, that so often when I have these theological discussions with individuals, is that often it turns out to be anthropological. It is man-centered, not God-centered. 
It ceases to be theology and becomes anthropology. So I said to a brother one day in our discussion, I said, you know what, I can't ascribe to any system that does not put God front and center. Just can't. I cannot embrace anything that marginalizes God. <laughs> and so Paul, when he talks about all the things that we experience, the blessings that we have in union with Christ, in the sphere of our relationship with Him, all of these things, he must begin with where glorification is due. It is uniquely due to God because He is the one who initiated all of this. Go back to before everything was created. What did He do? He chose us in Him. Thus in chapter 2, when he talks about our sinfulness and our response and, and all of that's going to happen, he is going to focus on the fact that it is about God. So God is uniquely revealed, and it's interesting the phrasing that he chooses here, and it might scare us when we first read it, because notice what he says. He is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. This places emphasis on his human nature, right? And this might scare us a little bit. Well, what do you mean he's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ? But Paul is focusing on the humanity of Christ. Just as in the same phrasing, he's going to focus on the deity of Christ. Why is this important? Because all of the blessings that we are to receive, there needs to be the great go-between. There is only one who can mediate the blessings between the Father to the rest of us, and that is the Son, who is fully man, but also fully God. And we have seen Christ, and he's uttered these words of himself, your God, my God, your Father, my Father. So he places emphasis upon his human nature, but then he references the fact that he is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This focuses on his divine sonship. He is son by nature. We are sons and daughters by means of adoption. It's a beautiful truth, isn't it? We are a part of God's family. We become joint heirs. With God the Son. Thus, as Paul goes through this letter, he's going to talk about the fact that it is through God's beloved Son that we will have access to the Father and in whom we will enjoy all freedom and confidence as we come before Him. And this is one profound truth that runs all the way through Ephesians that we will see that everything the Father does for the church and for us, He does for His glory and for the sake of His own beloved Son. So the question is then, where is their boasting for us? The answer is none unless it's in the Lord. But these are amazing truths because he moves on, as we saw in this passage in chapter 2, that we are now a part of the family of God. This is what is so beautiful. That through the Son, we can now call upon Almighty God as our Father. The description for the glorification then comes in verse 3, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time focusing on this, but the blessing that is stated for us, there's so much that is here that we need to unfold a little bit this morning as we move ahead, but he's going to talk about the nature of this blessing just simply by how he states it. He blessed us. Everything matters. This is why I love the letters. I, I can't like, so with the Gospels, these are a little bit tougher, right? Because with the Gospels, you have these vignettes. You have these stories about some event that took place and they're all compiled for a reason. So what you have to do is when you read the Gospels, you have to read every single vignette and you have to figure out why are they all put together in the string in which they're put together. And then you're trying to figure out what the main point of the story is. So you have this teaching, the parable, the Good Samaritan. But then you have this vignette about Mary and Martha. And you say, okay, well, why are these two things put next to each other? What's the point? Right? Makes things a little bit tougher. When you come to the epistles, I love them because every single word is packed full of truth. There's only so much space. <laughs> So as we walk through this, we don't blow past anything. We need to stop and reflect on it. And the very fact that he talks about the fact that we have been blessed, singular, singular. In other words, Paul is looking at this act of God and he is seeing it as a great singular whole. It involves everything that he has done. And he is going to then for us, as we walk through verses 4 and following, he is going to unfold everything that he means by this statement, he has blessed us. 
What does that look like? And in other words, he doesn't leave it for us to to sort of come up with, what do we think he means by that? No, he's going to tell us exactly what he means by that. What does it mean, the fact that God blessed us? And that he did it for every single one of us. This is an amazing letter. So I have to tell you, so in verse 1, we have at Ephesus, which it shouldn't be translated at Ephesus. It should be in Ephesus, and that's really what it is in the Greek. But the reason why this is so amazing is that in in our earliest manuscripts, the best that we have in Epheso, in Ephesus, is not there. So P46, which is the earliest manuscript that we have of Ephesians, which is closer to the time of the writing of the original writing of Ephesians, this statement in Epheso is not in it. So we also have other copies that have come later where it's put in the margins. Well, why is it put in the margin? Because it's not included in the text, which likely meant that it was not a part of the original. In other words, what I'm saying is that the letter that we've, we've called Ephesians and will continue to call Ephesians was likely not sent to the church of Ephesus first. In other words, this letter was intended to be a universal letter off the bat. If you read Paul's other letters, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, on and on we can go. There are always issues that he had to deal with in the church, Right? So he addresses them. Colossians, there's like four of them. Legalism and angel worship and asceticism and on and on. So he has all these problems he has to address. And then he mentions people by name. What's interesting is that he had never been to that church before, Colossi. They'd never seen him face to face. Or Romans. He writes this letter to a church he hasn't been to yet. But in chapter 16, he has a list of greetings of all of these people he sends greetings to. But here he writes a letter supposedly to a church in Ephesus, a church that he has been to longer than any other church. If you read Acts, over three years, he's in Ephesus. He mentions no person by name and not a single issue. Doesn't that seem odd? Does to me. Why do you, does that then become something that is so important for us to understand? Because this letter was meant to be easily read throughout the church by everybody. In other words, this is a letter that you and I can pick up and without sifting through it, figuring out what the problem in the church was and how they dealt with it and all of this stuff, and then figuring out how it applies to us. Essentially, we can pick this letter up and we can read it with us in it. In other words, I can read verse 4, just as he chose, right, me in him before the foundation of the world. It makes it easier for us to apply this to our own life. This is great for someone like me. And maybe you were one of those kids, right, when you played sports when you were younger, right? And, and you're doing something on the playground, and so all the kids gather together, and you're going to play a game, and so we're going to choose teams, and everyone starts picking out teams, right? And we've got the captain over here and the captain over here. They're usually the popular kids, and they're going to pick out all their team, teammates and all that, make up the team, and then we're going to play. And then maybe you're the one who's like me, like you're the last one chosen. All right, I guess I'll take Steve. Or maybe you're not the one who's chosen at all. Maybe they get done choosing the team and they say to you, sorry, but we're all filled up. Well, you can just hang around just in case someone gets hurt or maybe someone wants to take a rest and then you can step in and take their place. Otherwise, you're not chosen for anybody. But what Paul says to me is that you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. You see how amazing that is? Who am I and why am I here It's amazing truth. But see, the nature of this letter allows me to read it this way and to come into this and understand this. This is a a family letter from a heavenly father to all of his children everywhere. Paul says, this is about you. And if I think that my relationship with Christ started on the day that I was seven years old on Easter Sunday when I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, I thought wrong. In God's mind and design, that relationship started a long time before that. I 
Now, I know that that does just crazy things with our systems. But it says what it says. The blessing domain is given for us in this verse, verse 3, in every, in every spiritual blessing. This is the primary seed of the divine image. We were created in the image of God, and this is the spiritual dimension, the mind, heart, soul. We'll see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 through 24, Colossians 3, 10 and 11. Over and over we see this reality, but this is the beautiful truth of it. This is what makes us so unique from any other creature. I mean, if you're trying to figure out who you are, begin here. And you can say, well, can't I give expression to my own personality? Isn't there a personality that I have that's my own? And can I give expression to that? Absolutely. Aren't we, according to Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made? Yes. But here's the thing. That reality is always in reality and in relation with the fact that we are created in the image of God. In other words, if I ever give expression to my own personality, I must do so to the glory of God. But these are beautiful truths, aren't they? I mean, all of a sudden, it's like human beings, I mean, we're so much, there's so amazing truths that when it comes to who we are and how God has designed us, and the fact that we're display His nature and His glory and the things that we do in life, this is how He made us. But then we have society who's trying to reduce us to nothing more than just mere animals. I mean, I go out to the waterfront, some guy's out there with a guitar and pictures, and somehow he's trying to sell me on the fact that I need to stop eating meat because I'm just eating my own siblings. No. <laughs> We're different. <laughs> We're made to rule over them. Our spiritual dimension is also the fount from which makes us a human being. We're not merely biological creatures. It's not chemical imbalances that we're dealing with here. There's something far deeper and far more profound and far more amazing when we're talking about our makeup. And these truths are essential for us to know and understand as believers as we walk out there in the world. As a human being, we are a creature designed by God with a nature to consciously display God's greatness, His beauty, and His worth. You're made for a reason. A purpose, a glorious purpose, a worthy purpose, a purpose that counts. The things that I do for the Lord aren't empty. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That whatever I do when I serve the Lord is not empty, it's for eternity? I think of how many things I've done in my lifetime growing up, right? That when I look back, I'm going, what in the world was that for? And in the grand scheme of things, what did it measure out to? Nothing. We'll talk about this because the Germans did this to the Jews in a concentration camp. Trying to destroy them and break them, they took away their understanding of purpose and meaning in life. But this word spiritual refers to the spiritual sphere in which man's spirit belongs as opposed to the fleshly sphere. It's upon man's higher nature and upon his spirit that the Holy Spirit operates. And we're going to wrestle with these truths as we walk through this. But this is of paramount importance for us, the spiritual dimension of our life. We know that we have a body. But what's amazing to me is that Scripture doesn't tell me how to work out. <laughs> I wish it did sometimes when I was younger, but it doesn't. And the only thing that it says about working out is in 1 Timothy chapter 4. I know, I looked it up, right? It's the only place it talks about working out. And it's a little prophet. And it's actually where we get our English word gymnasium from in gymnastics. Gymnasia. So it's beneficial for a time, but there's a little profit to it, but not great profit. The greatest profit is godliness, Paul says. In other words, the spiritual is paramount. That's what really matters. And I'm all about we have an organic union between body and soul and so forth and how God designed us and all of that. But there is definitely a distinction that is made in the word of God. 
which tells me then when we look at prayer requests, we can pray for the physical. There's, there's nothing to say we can't do that. But it's interesting to me that every prayer that we find in the Word of God is spiritual. The only time we ever find anything physical, maybe physical, is when Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh. It's the only time. And what's amazing about this letter is there's so much prayer here. And I would argue that the first three chapters are in the context of prayer. And it's all spiritual. It's so hard for us at times in this life, and I know this, and especially when society is so naturally oriented. We're always looking for the natural explanations for everything, and we do this with weather and all of that, right? And we think that it really doesn't matter, right? It rained, it snowed. You will never find that in the Old Testament. It was always God sent the rain, God sent the snow. Who? Why? Because he controls everything. And we look at them with, well, what's the big deal? But it's, what are we communicating to those around us? Do we think that God is in control of everything? Because there are those in the church who actually think that somehow now we can control the weather. That was something that was solely God's to do. Now we've rendered to an it. <laughs> some blind force out there that's operating or some law of nature, right? Right? The spiritual is paramount in Ephesians. Everything is going to be focused this way. And therefore, there's need for a continued spiritual renewal in our life. And this is where the primary focus is, that we are to grow up into Christ in all things. And this is something that we need to focus on. And so, yeah, you can worry about what you eat. That's great. And if you can afford to eat the healthy stuff, awesome. That's wonderful for you. I love a great burger. Can't always afford them. But what's most important is the spiritual dimension of my life. Amen? The quantity then of this blessing, every spiritual blessing, it's interesting because he joins us with the word eulogetos, and it's singular, which we saw, and then he takes it and he links it with this, and so he makes it very clear for us that we are not lacking one single thing when it comes to our spiritual existence in Christ. Not one. There's nothing that God withholds from us. So I'll just tell you... Amazing truth. And just sit and dwell on that verse for a while. Okay? It's amazing truth. It's parallel to what Paul is talking about here. The next is that he tells us that these blessings are in the heavenly places. And this is important for us to know. Five times this phrase is used in the New Testament. All of them in this epistle. It is the sphere where God is, the sphere where Christ is, is the location of rulers and authorities, spiritual forces of wickedness, chapter 6, verse 12. Christ ascended far above all the heavens, and he sits at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, and this is where we sit, chapter 2. The prince of the power of the air is located in the lower heavens, the darkness of this world, and we're going to look at all of these elements, but this is a pregnant phrase, but really what he tells us off the get-go is that for us as believers, we are to live a life that is conditioned by transcendence. I am so localized in how I live my life. Oh, Paul is sitting in a Roman in prison. And he's just going, man, life is out there. It's huge what God is doing and the way that God works. And your citizenship isn't about here. It's about up there. And you're groveling for table scraps down here. Who am I in Christ? I am belonging to something that is far more beyond this realm. Something so much greater. Why do I keep fighting for the little scraps that are down here that aren't going to last very long? Especially when they're in the hands of certain individuals. This is the realm of spiritual activities. This is the unseen universe that lies behind the world of sense. For most of us, our week, if we really look at it, it's about what we taste, touch, smell, right, see. How much about what we don't see? How much of our life reflects the reality that lies behind all of this? Sometimes my fear is in politics, we also get so caught up with the little things, the skirmishes, that we lose part, sight of the big picture. 
There's a grand scheme behind all of these things that are going on. And sometimes we get so caught up in this thing and that thing and the other thing that we forget the big picture. Paul's going to help us to see that. But then we have to figure out how do we live in this life in light of that big picture? What does that look like for us? And we can begin by understanding the fact that, yes, we live life on this earth in our mortal bodies, but how can we embrace the inheritance that is in heaven and that is our position in Christ? How can we start to live that way? And that is by the Holy Spirit. This is why Christ sent him. He says, I have to go so that he can come. Why? So that he can abide in you. So that we can see life from God's perspective, not our own. The sphere of this blessing is in Christ. And I just laid this out for you, but the qualities, the, the whole statement of blessing and everything is connected to this particular phrase. It is a pregnant phrase. And everything from eternal election to eternal glory, everything is summed up in this in Christ. It reflects in the fact that each one of us is incorporated in Christ. It is a personal union. Every believer is personally, intimately incorporated directly in Christ. And what all of that looks like, we are going to unfold when we walk through these verses. But I put all of these authors up here for you in their quotes. And I do this simply because I want you to understand, all of these are grammarians, A.T. Robertson, Longenecker, Abbott Smith, all of them have written lexicons and Greek grammars, bagged Bauer, Arden, Ganger, Denker, all of them, right? None of them are theological works. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that I'm not trying to push some theological bent from some systematic book. These are all Greek grammarians and students of the New Testament and Christian writings, and this is how they understand this phrasing. When we talk about in Christ, as we say with Dana and Manti, it is talking about the mystical union we have with Christ. Paul uses it 164 times in his letters. Someone has said that you could sum up Paul's theology with grace and peace. I would suggest to you that you can sum up all of Paul's theology with in Christ. In Christ. Without Christ, we are nothing. In Christ, we are everything because he is everything. And we share in him and who he is. So Paul is going to take us on this journey. He's going to talk about the fact that in Christ there was a plan that was created. Before the universe was created, God created a plan. And this is the terminology that Paul uses. Before God created the universe, he created a plan. And in that plan, he created a place for you and I. Who am I? If you want to answer that question, dwell on these thoughts. And then ask yourself, why am I here? <laughs> Before God created the universe, he created a plan. And in that plan, he created a place for you and I. A specific place. A unique place, just as unique as David, just as unique as Paul, just as unique as John the Baptist. Not only that, but in Christ then he blessed us with every spiritual blessing going all the way back to eternity past. And then in Christ, all of creation was brought into existence. Colossians 1.16. Don't blow past these truths. I ask you to take this journey with me to dwell on them and think about the implications that are here. Because one of the things we're going to talk about is that when we look at eternity past, was there a static existence for God or was there something happening? It would seem there was something happening. <laughs> Amen? Something huge. These are amazing truths. And, and I pray that we don't try to fit them into anything that we have ever learned and studied and whatever. Just let the book speak for itself. Let God take us where he wants to take us. But let's do theology in community. Amen? Let's wrestle with these things together. Because these are answers that everyone around us are asking and will continue to ask. And we need to have the answers for them. Thus we need to know them clearly. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we're so thankful for the truths that you have revealed to us from, for your word and the way that you have providentially preserved it for us, Father. We thank you for the privilege it is to be able to spend time studying it and dwelling upon who you are and your nature and being. And Father, how you have worked and continue to work and your intent and in everything. We realize that you are moving towards an end in which you are going to sum up all things in Christ. And we realize that everything that Satan does is going to be a cheap counterfeit to that. He sells the world on that, but I pray, Father, that we will not be sold on it. 
that we will understand clearly what you are doing and what you are about. That we will understand clearly as much as we can from your word what your intents are for the future and how you're going to bring all of these things into consummation and then how we can live in light of that truth right here, right now in our life. That we might bring you glory and honor because you are so worthy of it. You are so worthy of every moment of our life. You are so worthy of every breath that we take, every thought that we have, every emotion that we express, every will, every desire, every passion. And even if we gave every single second of our life to the glorification of you, there is no way that we'll ever be worthy of who you are. But Father, I pray that we don't stop trying to make known your glory to this world. May we be good image bearers. As far as we can understand and know who you are, may we make that be known to the world. May we live in light of these realities. And may you be glorified. Pray these things in your name.